Um, before I talk a little bit about what, uh, what keeps me up at night, what we look at, where we see trends, and more importantly, how do we operationalize digital transformation in Nokia, uh, I want to show you uh, an ad. And with Karen's permission, uh, uh, an ad produced by Microsoft, and it's one of the coolest apps I've seen so far lately. It's very, very cool. And you, some of you might have seen this before, the wedding. I am delighted we could share in the serenity and joy of this beautiful day as we come together to celebrate the commitment Excuse me. of these Would two. Would you mind moving your enormous phone? You mean the enormously awesome galaxy? Search, one trick pony. Aren't you a little young to have an iPhone? You want to go? I see copy bots. I'll correct this. <clears throat> Smartphone of the year. <laughs> Thank you. That goes to Microsoft. Uh, beautiful ad, really funny, and uh, struck a nerve with many of us, uh, I think. And we've probably seen similar scenes before. Probably, perhaps not the fighting. <laughs> Everybody loves a comeback. Uh, us, pro uh, uh, the most, of course. And I think. What Nokia has achieved in the past uh, two years in terms of the renewed product portfolio and our strategy with partnering with Microsoft, I think it's just testament of how much progression and transformation we've done together as partners and as a business. Uh, two days ago, we launched the 925, uh, so far our flagship store, uh, flagship uh, product, uh, uh, building on the success of the 920, really having the most innovative smartphone of the year, according to Engadget. So we're very proud, and the launch went very well, and we've, we're, we're monitoring the social media listening space, and we're seeing a lot of great feedback from the consumers and also from the industry uh, analysts, as well as the influencers. And um, my role at uh, Nokia is to lead the digital marketing organization. And maybe just a little bit of background. We have four major teams in my team at the global level, about 70 headcounts. We're organized around campaigns, analytics, and um, uh, the board media, which we do with a partnership with Karat and Aegis. Then we have a team looking after our uh, uh, websites and our e-commerce uh, uh, operations. We don't do direct selling. We have a referral engine driving leads to our partners, retailers, and operators. And we've earlier this year launched, uh, uh, re revamped our website and combining our mobile website and our desktop uh, or PC website into one experience in a responsive HTML5 deployment, which means that the site uh, scales depending on the screen size that you, that you access the site with, and there are certain breakpoints depending on the screen size, and it's a mobile first optimized experience. So we start with the smallest screen, the smallest phone that can access the site, enhance and optimize the user experience on that with the functionality available on those phones, and then slightly scale up functionality, picture resolution, until you really get a full screen HD experience on the website. We're rolling this now out in a number of countries around the world. The global side is live, UK, US, and a number of other countries are live. And the industry is talking about it, and it's uh, the biggest HTML5 responsive rollout the world has ever seen. So we're very proud of leading the, leading the way and creating a, a unified experience that works on, across many different screens. We're no short of having an ambitious vision in our team. Uh, sorry, and the third team I uh, forgot to mention is our CRM consumer data and privacy team, which is a very important function, and I'm very glad that it falls under the digital marketing function, doesn't sit outside, so we can uh, very closely integrate our activities, not just from a board and campaign, but also from a retention and loyalty perspective in our CRM programs. Our mission in our team is this year to create awesome digital experiences, and that's pretty much the most important bit. That we really see a world where just showing someone an ad or giving him a message is, is, a, is an important part of marketing, but what's much more important is what comes after they see the message, once they have the awareness. How do we increase the, our product consideration with great digital experiences that engage, that perhaps sometimes even co-create with our consumers, or even crowdsourced from the very early stage of the idea and we have many examples pushing these boundaries, not just in digital, but for our entire marketing group. And ultimately, we want to delight you, the Nokia consumers. 
So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about trends, uh, share a bit of the roadmap on the strategy we deployed uh, two years ago when we wanted to transform our business, transform our marketing operation, to become more digital savvy and ultimately more, more effective with our investments in marketing and the digital channels. And then talk a little bit about a couple of examples in terms of the unstable media. With Karen's permission, I'm gonna quote your CEO, Steve Ballmer, who a couple of years ago uh, made a very controversial quote. He said, all media will be digital in 10 years. And then he got asked by analysts and reporters over and over again until he at some point replied, you know, you know what, I don't care if it happens in 10, seven, or five years. And obviously he's referring to the um, advertising addressable market of around $560 billion a year where we can actually uh, create engaging experiences with consumers. So for Mike, probably you have to ask yourself the question as well, do you believe this? Is all media going digital? And I think uh, uh, when, you, when you look far enough in the future, you can probably agree. So we, probably most of us would agree to the point. The question is how fast is it gonna happen? With that in mind, obviously it's very important to, if the future is highly digital, if not all digital in the very near future, we have 2.5 billion people on the, on the planet logging onto the internet. Uh, it's a huge opportunity that we cannot ignore anymore and it has to be uh, really woven into the way we do business, and the way we do marketing, and the way we engage with consumers and not just expose them to advertising. One of our corporate missions is to connect the next billion people to the internet with our Asha and mobile phone devices and uh, product groups. And when we look at the usage and the device sales, last year was the first year where the smartphone outpaced the PC sales. And by the end of this year, analysts are saying that this will be the time, at the end of this year, where more people log on to the internet with anything but a PC. And that's a huge shift. In many markets, uh, uh, as reference, I was living in Singapore for 11 years, in many of those markets in Southeast Asia and Asia, that's already a reality. 90% of our traffic on the Nokia sites there come from mobile devices rather than from PCs. So having a mobile strategy is not just uh, timely, it's absolutely critical. And I was just yesterday at the mobile engagement event where the stat was passed around that still 50% of all websites worldwide don't have a mobile optimized version, which is uh, unacceptable, I think. So we are also increasing significantly our operational capability and our investment into mobile marketing, a key point uh, where you can take the paradigm of, of, of creating the, the right message to the right person at the right time at the right location adding another dimension to the, the targeting and making the relevant connection with the consumer of where they are and what context they're in. Another important trend uh, about one and a half years ago, Wired magazine had an article about the web is dead. I don't know if you heard about this. And they basically looked at the traffic patterns in the US, for example, of how, what's transmitted over the internet in terms of protocols. Is it the uh, World Wide Web? Is it FTP? Is it peer-to-peer? -peer? And you can see here in uh, pink um, a very clear trend that video is taking up more and more bandwidth of our internet infrastructure. Obviously, it's not fair to compare a, a, a huge file size video, excuse me, with images and text of a web page in terms of uh, fair comparison. A video takes a lot more space up. But there's a clear trend here to see. And when we look closer to this trend of video consumption on the internet or internet enabled devices, it's a massive opportunity. In fact, the opportunity becomes evident when you look at all the TV content worldwide and how a quarter of that is ads, and all the online video content online, and only 1.5% is ads. So it's a huge opportunity to connect the audience in more meaningful ways, and I hope in a better way than you've done in the past, not making consumers sit through 10 minutes ad breaks that most people just skip if they record, or leave the room, or just completely ignore and switch the channel. So with, uh, with capabilities of targeting and pay-per-view pricing models and the video <coughs> ecosystem, it's another huge opportunity that we're gonna scale up very quickly together with the help of Aegis and Karat. This uh, is actually the YouTube interface. If you go to youtube.com slash TV, uh, you see this kind of interface and it's, uh, it's highly optimized for, for uh, perhaps a, a more easier a control device like a remote control or just the arrow keys or the mouse and it really shows you how, how the video consumption is moving to an almost TV-like interface and, and consumption mode. Yesterday uh, at the Mobile Engage conference they also talked about the different types of multi-screen experiences and the modes consumers are in. May it be a complete parallel mode, for example you do your emails and you watch TV 
may it be a, a dedicated mode where you don't watch TV and only use your device, or most importantly, where you share different devices having the same experiences. Great story was uh, when Shazam came out with the capability of listening to, to audio signals in the TV program in terms of audio and then syncing the Shazam app with the content on TV if a TV advertiser or TV content producer has enabled that, of course. It's creating experiences that leverages then two screens at the same time to deliver a more richer and more um, appealing solution to the consumers. Now when we think about transformation and you think about the, this is just a visualization of the last 210 years of, of how people have consumed uh, information or, or the media consumption habits have evolved, if you will. There's something wrong on those slides though. Can somebody point out what's, what's not quite correct with this visualization? Can somebody see that? Well look at the scale. It's not, it's not, it's nor linear, linear nor proportional. It actually has completely different steps. It's from 18 to 1850, so 50 years, and here there's three years. If you put this on a linear uh, visualization, it would look something like this, as, as everything just happened. And that's uh, another example of how technology-driven um, uh, industries have a pace of almost accelerating nature, where according to Moore's law, every 18 months the processing power doubles. And that's an exponential ex uh, acceleration. So in the digital marketing environment, I think everybody who works in that industry is pretty aware how fast-paced the changes are happening. First there was social, uh, sorry, digital, then there was social, now there's mobile, now we're getting into location, and in ever more uh, fragmented environment. So we realized now digital transformation work at Nokia that actually the real capability that we need to teach our people in our organization is change management to really make sure that we are uh, not only embracing change, but really loving it and really looking for every opportunity that we have to change into a new uh, context or new paradigm, not to lose any uh, opportunities that this new media environment is offering us. And uh, uh, Charles Darwin actually didn't say it, it was his colleague. Uh, he said it's not the strongest uh, of the species that, uh, that survives or the most intelligent, nor is it the one, uh, uh, the, the richest or the, the, the most powerful. It's actually the one that's adopted fastest to change. And let me show you this next video. All you need is a big idea to make it all happen. So let's get this big idea out there, into the mass market. With a well-aimed shot, you'll be able to talk to everybody. The world is within your reach through TV, newspapers, magazines, press, billboards, and on the radio. Your message will certainly reach the consumer. After all, you know their habits and expectations in great detail. Ah, the consumer really gets your brand now. You might even say that they love your product. You can count on them that before buying it, they'll talk about it and exchange ideas with their friends, family, and workmates. But you wouldn't want to leave anything to chance, so to make sure they're really going to buy into your image, you maybe give them a little hand with a bit of PR, just to tip them over into a frenzy with some flattering editorial. After that comes the critical moment, poised at the point of purchase. It's time to guarantee that the deal will be clinched and they'll not be swayed by some other alluring choice further down the aisle. Be calm, hold your nerve, you've invested well. The brand wins through, the sale is made. Talking about numbers, we'll divide the budget the way we always have. 70% on mass media and the rest on the other actions to help things happen at the point of purchase. 360 degrees of integration. The brand's job is done, everyone's happy. Let's get back to today, the 21st century. Here's your brand, still there, still strong, and of course your big idea is close at hand. But this time we have a few more choices. Things are a little more complicated. We're going to encounter some new things. The internet, interactive media, mobile communications. Don't panic. We can still reach the consumer through this new media, but there's something different. They won't passively accept what you have to say. Especially if your message is not genuinely relevant and interesting. Truthfully, they receive so much information that they'll maybe not even remember your brand. But let's suppose your idea is really genius, that it's shone through to the consumer's eyes. Maybe now they want to talk to you. They want to meet you. They want to know more. Of course you did a great job on PR planning, including your digital editorials to make sure the consumer got enough information on the product. But this isn't enough to get the consumer to make a decision. They'll want to know more, and it's so much easier to consult with other people today. Family, close friends and workmates are online, although now they have new contacts. 
friends of friends who connect them to millions of people spread around the world through rapidly expanding communities of social media. In this connected environment, they'll easily seek out information on blogs, video reviews and forums. And what you may not have noticed before is the sheer extent of conversation that's happening around and about your brand. People regularly make comments and discuss what they're up to. Good comments, we hope, if you've done your job right. To get the real story, the first thing the consumer will do before anything else is search for what people are really saying. They'll come across the same social networks, blogs and so on. With some help, will invariably come first to your brand's website or maybe the mobile site of your brand if they're out on the move. It's important, of course, to consider your combined strategy for how to get the best out of search engine marketing and optimization to guarantee that the first search results are always for your brand. The work of search engine marketing should be seen as complementary very often the consumer will find your brand through the association with words that express its context. Understanding the appropriate moment to be close to the consumer with your brand became extremely important. So relax. The consumer has got everything they need to make their decision. They've passed through the phase of experience, exchanged references, and they're finally determined to buy your product. They've got to the point of purchase that now includes e-commerce, e-auction, e-retail, e-anything you can imagine, and now, finally, they make the purchase. Talking about numbers, putting all your money on traditional media doesn't really do this justice anymore. Instead of spending all our money up front, we need to think about how we can sustain our relationship over 365 days a year, rather than just focus on 360 integration. The 20th century was defined by bought media. This was marketing. Nowadays, besides buying media, you have your own audience, and most important, it's possible to learn how to harness the power of buzz around your brand. The earned media money can't buy. I thought it was a great visualization comparing a little bit the 20th century marketing model and how it's evolved and it's become a little bit more complex, a little bit more complicated, but the fundamentals are still there. You still need great ideas based on excellent consumer insights derived through or, or communicated through a lot more touch points now. But one important piece that is gaining more and more important is the advocacy, is the ecosystem that you're operating in. What do friends say when the brand is not listening? What are the reviewers saying on review sites? And how are you represented in the organic results, not just your website, but with your product reviews? And paying attention to that and increasing your third-party ecosystem footprint in a positive and, and uh, uh, nice way is obviously very critical to, to the success. The other thing is that this ecosystem or this model is, I think, still constantly evolving. And it's, uh, it's really a great quote by Alvin Toffler, who says, um, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who can read and write, but those who can learn, unlearn, and relearn to really kind of embrace this constant accelerating change within, uh, within digital marketing and beyond. We created a program two years called Digital Transformation to really look at all the different levers uh, we have within the marketing uh, context in terms of how do we structure the organization. Uh, how do we have the reporting lines? Where do we have the resources locally, regionally, uh, or, or at a global level? W how do we work? How do we work with our agency partners? What's the kind of processes and marketing uh, um, steps that we're taking? And where does digital sit? And when does it sit? Uh, at what point? So getting digital much more uh, upfront, right in the idea cr uh, ideation process is absolutely critical to harness the opportunities of that touch point, in terms of interactivity, data, apps, and so on. And then most importantly, you obviously have to look at talent. What kind of people do you have? What kind of job descriptions do you put out there? What kind of talent are you attracting and how are they actually working and putting their competencies into place? One thing we learned is, um, was an interesting statistic that the business impact of an individual is only 35% determined by his capability or expertise and 65% by his attitude. So creating the right culture, the right mindset, the right w reward mechanisms to reward desired behavior when it comes to digital, fact-based, data-driven decisions, it's very critical to integrate into this thinking of marketing capability um, uh, acceleration around digital. And if you have an organization who is willing to learn, then, uh, then obviously nothing can stop you. And uh, let me show you some examples of um, how we tackle this ever-increasing and, and or morphing ecosystem of digital marketing. And there's so many things happening and there's so many new ways of or tactics, new opportunities, new stakeholders, new formats, constantly evolving and, and we're being bombarded with. And obviously making sure that the, your marketing organization is laser focused on what you want to achieve and not get too distracted on this ever-changing ecosystem is very critical. And to provide them that focus and to really 
nail uh, the, the, the right tactics and the right initiatives versus things that you might be able to stop do or perhaps that you don't try out and you don't create. Um, the, the, the key driver in our organization is data. Data is really the new oil and it really helps you understand um, what's going on, not just what people say they would do in terms of focus groups, what is actually happening in terms of behavioral data. And uh, data, as you all know, can be very, very quickly overwhelming, especially if you don't know what you're looking for. And we've now developed uh, with our agency partners and others um, a digital measurement framework that looks at the consumer outcomes. And we have four phases. The first one is learn more. You want to learn more about our products. And the role is to increase product consideration. Then we looked at all the digital engagements that, that, that were in our control and said, well, which one of those engagements is actually increasing consideration the most? And you can do this with the pre and post survey and determine what engagement. Is it the page view? Is it that page view or that page view? Or is it the video view? Or is it playing with the emulator? And then really identifying the key engagements that increase product consideration the most. And we call them high quality engagements. And they obviously are way beyond the funnel than just showing someone clicking on an ad, visiting the site. But what do they do on the site? So really very conversion based optimization. Then once you learn more about the products and you've increased your um, your, your knowledge and your consideration of the product, you move into the buy more phase. And in, in there, we obviously want to facilitate and make sure that people are aware of the best deals, the pricing, the options, the different types of uh, partners that we sell our products with, and really drive them with our referral engine, the right leads to the right partner to convert into a sale. The third phase is do more once you have the product. And uh, how can we increase our product satisfaction uh, with NPS scores? How can we do a, a service level uplift of our services? And really, again, look at all the engagements in that phase of a consumer and what kind of outcomes they're interested in, and then identify the ones which drive uh, retention the highest or customer satisfaction the highest. And those then become the KPIs for all digital marketing in that phase. And overarching across all these three phases is the, sh uh, the tell more phase where every, at every piece of the way you want to socialize your content, you want to facilitate, enable, and ultimately inspire people to share the content that you've created with others. So the actual sharing is uh, uh, the KPI uh, for Nokia and Telmore. So really driving in the best quality content in our channels and Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and others, and look at what of this content is actually being shared outside of our fan base, outside of our followers, to really tap into this kind of indirect endorsement of the user when he takes a piece of content and shares it to his network. So counting the shares and optimizing our content, and our social initiatives around the sharing capability. Very key point. Now we're obviously in a transition uh, with Nokia and we're in a, a challenger mindset. We're not the number one mobile phone manufacturer anymore. We lost it to Samsung last June but we're making progress of getting back. And um, in this challenger mindset, uh, we really challenge the way we do business, the way we do market, the way we use data, and to reinvent and innovate, not just from our product perspective, but also in the way we engage consumers. And I don't know if you've, uh, uh, can I just see a raise of hands, who has seen Moneyball, the, the movie? Oh, fantastic, half. Fantastic uh, 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 film. Just maybe a quick story. So Brad Pitt is the, the trainer and he gets handed a team which is mediocre and he has almost no budget uh, to buy new players. In fact, he's losing all his good players. And he, he is basically traveling around the country to form a new team with almost no budget. And he sits in a session with a competing team where they trade players and he realizes that the chief coach is always looking at this guy in the corner, a young guy, not a trainer, not a coach. And then when he nods, he nods. Uh, and agrees to the deal. If he says no to the proposal of the deal, trade this player to this player, and, and the guy in the corner says no, then he doesn't do it. So he's, he walks out of the meeting, he's really startled because he knows this head coach and, and he never seen him listen to someone else so consistently. So he finds this guy and this guy is actually an analyst. And what he does is he created an algorithm util utilizing player stats, the, pro the pure data in baseball. Uh, how many hits, how many runs, and, and, and so on. And based on that, he makes this decision if this player is worth trading in or trading out. And he is, gets so impressed with him because he realizes he, he can't do it the traditional way for, to, to build a new baseball team. So he hires the guy, and he, and, and he has a lot of challenges of implementing it and getting people to buy in this model, choosing player based on their data profile rather than the perception they have in the public. And he is so successful with that team, writing baseball history, um, winning more games than any other baseball team has ever won, 
Uh, I won't give out the end uh, of, the, of the movie away, but the model he's created has revolutionized not only baseball, but every s a professional sport around the planet. Almost no team, may it be soccer, rugby, or basketball, any other, does not rely on a heavy set of data to make informed, fact-based decisions, whether, whether I, um, to really understand what's, what's the real opportunity. And there's a great scene I wanted to show you when the, 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 um, the general manager of the, or the owner of the Red Sox team makes him an offer, tries to get him to manage his team. And this is the conversation the two have. For 41 million, you built a playoff team. You lost Damon, Giambi, Isringhausen, Pena, and you won more games without them than you did with them. You won the exact same number of games that the Yankees won, but the Yankees spent 1.4 million per win, and you paid 260,000. I know you're taking it in the teeth out there, but the first guy through the wall, he always gets bloody. Always. This is threatening, not just a way of doing business, but, it's, but in their minds, it's threatening the game. But really, what it's threatening is their livelihood. It's threatening their jobs. It's threatening the way that they do things. And every time that happens, whether it's a government or a way of doing business or whatever it is, the people who are holding the reins and have their hands on the switch, they go batshit crazy. I mean, anybody who's not tearing their team down right now and rebuilding it using your model, they're dinosaurs. They'll be sitting on their ass on the sofa in October watching the Boston Red Sox win the World Series. And he makes them an offer, and they never really say, but the, it's a real story, by the way. The whole thing is a real story. Um, the offer was the highest offer ever in American sports history. A coach, or general manager in this case, had been offered as a, as a salary. It was the highest figure ever. And I'm not going to give it away. If you haven't seen the movie, see what happens, what Brad Pitt does with it. Um, one very important aspect is while data is absolutely critical, and we, I think we need to significantly invest in our capability to understand, zero in, focus on the right data points, on the right metrics, to really operationalize in many of our organizations, not just in Nokia, but to really operationalize our fact-based decision-making processes, to really having a very media-neutral uh, approach and really let the data decide which, uh, which touch point, which format, which media owner, which engagement can actually deliver on your marketing objectives at the lowest cost. And I think all of us are probably hit by uh, declining headcounts, cut budgets, resource, resource crunches, left, right, and center. So, and you, you're continuously being asked to deliver ever more with less resources. And I think data can be your best friend on that. But data can solve everything. As you all know, as great marketers, there is a left brain, and it's probably been neglected in marketing for quite some time now, but the right brain, the, the real creative side of things, the great idea, the innovation, the emotional kind of connection, as we've seen with the first ad at the, at the wedding, to really hit a nerve in consumers' mind of what's going on right now, is absolutely critical to never lose that out of sight, because you can't just make decisions on data. You have to find the right balance. The right balance is obviously um, uh, very important when you, when, you, when you think about the ever-exploding ecosystem in terms of screens and sizes and devices, and basically taking the approach of making no assumptions of what the user is using each of the device for and being more responsive and more agile and more real-time in terms of the consumer needs when they come to your own media platforms. And as I mentioned before, we've now launched in many markets our responsive side and it scales beautifully depending on the screen. So if you go to your browser, you go to nokia.com slash global and then you, 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 you pull your browser window wider and smaller, you see how the four columns get reduced to two columns, one column always looking perfect layout, perfect font. The image sizes decrease or increase automatically to your screen breakpoint. That means you always get the optimal visual experience and layout uh, experience on that side. At the same time, we're using a component-based concept which has basically broken up every piece of content, every module, every app, every service that we have on the website to individual components. And then there's a first view of those components when you come to the homepage, but ultimately employing smart optimization tools like intelligent targeting that we're using to optimize the user experience and the layout of these components on the fly based on the optimal user experience and user journey defined by the outcomes you want to achieve. Do more, buy more, uh, learn more, or tell more. 
So we talked a little bit about trends um, uh, and what we see, and the key thing is obviously if the future is all digital, then we cannot ignore it anymore. We have to really embrace it fully and uh, also think about how you invest your uh, marketing uh, and especially the working media budgets. Uh, at Nokia now, we're, we're investing more in digital touch points than on any other touch points, and the trend is very clear. Traditional touch points are declining rapidly, and digital touch points are ever increasing in terms of their share. And this is not something that basically, they, we don't do this because I say so, because I'm the VP for digital, I'm a bit biased. It's because that's this thing we find out with econometric modeling, with consumer insight study. Consumers are spending more and more time for more and more tasks, for more and more content and digital platforms. No doubt about it. If any market is not quite there yet, they will be there in one or two years. So it's not unignorable anymore. Uh, and then obviously thinking about when you transform and you're trying to harness these opportunities, try to think of the engine of your digital marketing operation fueled by data and, and strong KPI measurement framework. And if you do that, a lot of things can happen in the ecosystem, new trends can come up, and you'll be able to cope with it because you'll very quickly find out does it work or it doesn't work. And when it works, obviously you can scale it up, and if it doesn't work, you can shut it down. With that, um, if you're interested uh, to read what I read, what goes into my head, have a look at my blog. I have an advertising three blog with about 20,000 digital marketers regularly on it. And I always share, whenever I find a cool presentation, a nice podcast, a great infographic around the future shape of marketing, I always share it there on the, on the blog. Because I think information is power when it's shared. Thank you very much.